build this early and not that. Well, simple enough. Most people know not to build items like Deathbringer early and know that there are other choices that are better. Not everyone does, new players often don't, but everyone learns relatively quickly from getting a slap on the wrist by their teammates. Why, however, are certain items better suited for early game than others? If you've been in Smite for a while, you will know that this is related to power curves. Different items, or different item builds rather, have different power curves and depending on the power curve, one build will be superior to another. What is a power curve? A power curve measures the power of two builds against each other at certain points. So for example, how good is this build at 3000 gold compared to another build? How good is this build at doing one specific thing compared to another build? And all these kinds of things. You could say, for example, which build is better at which point for taking on objectives, for boxing, for clearing. There are many, many options in that context that can be considered. But it's not always as simple as getting the cheapest item first. For example, if we're looking at stacking items, you will have items that are relatively expensive, or towards the more expensive end of the spectrum at least, and that will still be built relatively early, just to have a better curve throughout the game. So in that case, you're spending more upfront, but then over the game, you transition into a more powerful build than your opponent. The complexity of that shouldn't be underrated because depending on which item is slightly in favor, builds can heavily change, which we can for example see with the SPL at the moment where the Crusher was always the default start on Daji and regardless we've now seen Crusher being built after Jotun's Wrath again. So the shift in performance and the power curves between items can be very very different based on slight changes or depending on what you want to achieve in a particular game. Sometimes a little less damage is fine if you have more cooldown reduction and can help your team more as a support, for example. Now there are some items for a few roles that are pretty much popular for their cheap power curves. For hunters or AA assassins, that is Ikaival. For solos, warriors specifically, that is Gladiator's Shield. For junglers, we don't really have an item like that, unless, once again, we're talking about AA assassins. But we have Ancela, which can counter specific matchups in specific situations and it's rather cheap. Then for supports, we have the rarely built Stone of Binding. And for mages, we also don't really have an option, but if we had an option, it would be between Doom Orb or Dynasty Planetelm. Both items are simply not valued enough at the moment to be picked up, even though they are pretty good price-wise and offer a decent amount of power, but mage builds just tend to favor more late game oriented, stronger items. What I want to do in this video is show how much of a difference a build with a basically ideal power curve or a very good power curve does in comparison to one with a very bad power curve. Now, in neither case, there are bad items used here. The items that I will throw into the ring, so to speak, are all good items. They're just not good at the same point of the game. Before we get into the numbers, keep in mind that many situationals can be better in some situations. For example, concise is typically not a very strong early game item. There are situations, however, where Concise actually gets a reasonable amount of DPS regardless, as the enemy team may be stacking up a lot of health very early into the game and you know that you want to build into this item relatively early. That may shift your build a little bit. You may, for example, want to go Ninja Teve and then Ikaival and then directly into Concise in order to get a lot of attack speed to maximize the effect from that. Would be an option to look at in a particular circumstance, but is not the norm. And similarly, Executioner could be very important in certain matchups if the enemy team has three tanks, for example, very early, then you would maybe consider rushing Executioner after boots, whereas normally you would look for better trading in lane with other options. But for the sake of the comparison here, let's take a more standard option. What we're going to look at is a very power curve efficient build, being Hunter's Blessing into Warrior Tawai, then a Kaival, and then if there's enough gold left, we would also add a tier 2 Executioner or Concise. On the other hand, we also have Hunter's Blessing, Warrior Tabai, in order to make it not completely horrible, but then after that we add Deathbringer. We'll compare this on a level 10 Karnonos, a typical hunter with decent attack speed, who has 42 protections on that level, and we assume a mirror here would always be a little bit different if we have another hunter or something, but for the sake of making this simple, it's two level 10 Karnonos against each other. The stats that we have to keep here in mind are your in-hand damage, which also includes the extra damage from Hunter's Blessing, plus your base damage, the attack speed, the crit chance, the penetration that you may have, and the crit multiplier, which is affected by Deathbringer, as well as the overall gold and the resulting damage per second. Our base here is Hunter's Blessing plus Warrior Tabai. What we have here is 132 in-hand damage, we have 1.29 attack speed, no crit chance, no pen and no crit multiplier. 
The overall price for these items is 2300 gold and the resulting DPS damage per second is 119.92 or 120. Now we want to add items to both builds that are somewhat similar in value to see how the power curve develops. What we will add here on one hand is tier 2 Deathbringer, that's short sword, which will cost 1500 gold, bring us to a total of 3800. The build with Echival has a very similarly priced item being Echival. Echival comes in at 1700 gold, so ever so slightly more you want to back a little bit later, but then until roughly 3000 gold both builds would stay with this item, even though if you have Echival you could back in between if you want to get a tier 1 execution as well a light blade. But in order to not make this overly complex, we'll stick with Short Sword and Echival here. When we build Tier 2 Deathbringer, then our base damage in hand damage goes up to 152. Our attack speed is 1.29 and our crit chance is now 10%, 0.1. The penetration remains at 0 and the crit multiplier is the standard 2, meaning 200% damage. As a result, for 3800 gold, you get 152 DPS. But now what happens if you're actually trading with someone that has Echival? They will have a power reduction against you, reducing your power to up to 21. You won't always have this reduced power, especially if you engage first, but typically it will happen relatively early in a trade. In that case, your in-hand damage goes down to 131, your attack speed remains the same, your crit chance, pen and crit multiplier also remain the same in the goal obviously as well. But seeing as that actually brings your power under what you would have with no short sword, that definitely chunks from your DPS, only a little bit more added here due to the crit. So your DPS is now 131. So at this point you'd pay 1500 gold, but only get 11 extra DPS out of it. And then on the other hand we have Echival. If you build Echival, your in-hand damage will be 132, your attack speed will be higher, 1.54, you will not have crit, but you will have 10 flat penetration and no crit multiplier. The overall price here, 4000 gold. The DPS that results out of that for Echival is 154. That means it's already better than Deathbringer in its normal state. It is heavily better than Deathbringer in its state with the reduced power. But to be fair, you're also paying ever so slightly more. But that isn't the end of Echival, because this is before the power steal. Echival can still add up to 30 extra power now that it's changed again. That means it has 162 in hand damage while remaining on the same attack speed and same penetration. In this case the overall DPS goes up to 189. If you look at the numbers in comparison just between the items here, it's actually pretty crazy how much more DPS you can get out of Echival very very easily. Even at its lowest point it's still stronger than tier 2 Deathbringer, at its highest point it's much much stronger. And that's how it should be, right? Because this is an early game item. But let's just say it doesn't get much better from here. Again, we're not even factoring in the fact that even now, a bit later, you could back to get the tier 1 light blade as well in order to further get your lead out of the items that you have. But let's assume you can't back until you have the next full item. In that case, we have Deathbring on one hand and Echival plus the tier 2 executioner or kid size on the other hand. That is balanced blade. So with Deathbringer you would now have 172 power. You would still have 1.29 attack speed as you're not investing into that. Your crit chance goes up to 0.25 or 25%. You have no penetration and a crit multiplier of 2.3 or 230% due to the added 30% from Deathbringer's passive. That brings your overall DPS to a solid 207. Now again you could have a trade with somebody with a Kaiwal and they would reduce your power. In that case your power would go down to 151, you have still the same attack speed, crit chance etc. and your overall DPS ends up at 182. On the other side we have Echival plus tier 2 executioner. 147 power here, 1.69 attack speed, no crit chance, once again 10 penetration and no crit multiplier. Total price 5250 gold, so a 50 gold difference, 50 gold cheaper than Deathbringer. Total APS without any stacks here is 188. Now in a trade when a Kaival gets stacks, you go up to 177 power. With all other stats once again remaining the same, that pushes your DPS up to 227. So far beyond the boundaries of what Deathbringer can reach at all. And Deathbringer additionally also relies on luck, if you don't crit the DPS goes down pretty hard. So on one hand we have a minimum DPS of 188, 
and up to 226, whereas on the other hand we have 181 to 207. So even in this scenario, with this very strong item that Deathbringer still is, a Kyvon Executioner will still come out on top early game. But now you may rightfully say that that's only at maximum stacks and that's not really fair because a lot of trades or a lot of the damage in trades happens before those stacks are full. Fair enough, let's look at what happens if we only have one stack. If we have one stack on Deathbringer, then it will lose 7 power, now 165. That brings the total DPS to 199. On Ekaival and Executioner together, one extra stack is 10 extra power. That brings the total DPS to 201. So it only takes a single stack with Ekaival and Executioner to overpower Deathbringer in its best form in terms of raw DPS. And that does not even factor in the fact that this is just looking at basic attacks. Looking at abilities, extra power will only affect the ability damage from scaling, which is usually lower, and it will not affect the extra base damage, whereas penetration affects the base damage, more damage goes through to the target in total, so it affects both base damage and scaling, and it will overall deal way more damage with most abilities. So again, another win for Archival. And it also doesn't factor in the fact that you're much more ready to counter build at this point. You can quickly finish the item into an executioner or concise depending on the situation and you're basically on your path to the next item already. Whereas with executioner you would then start the next item and not have it halfway finished already. That all isn't to say that Deathbringer is a bad item though and I want to emphasize this here. In the right place in a build with enough attack speed and power behind it, Deathbringer becomes a lot more efficient and especially when you have two crit items it becomes even more efficient. So it is not bad at all, it is just not suited as a very early item choice when trading in lane is so important and being able to get that leverage over your opponent through atomization and through smart plays at the same time should be your goal until late game. With that, thank you guys for watching, I hope this example made understanding power curves and early game item choices a little bit easier. If you like this video and you're new to the channel, feel free to sub button with the bell, it really helps me out. Other than that, see you for the next one tomorrow. Duke Sloth, out.